This is Rumble with Michael Moore, and I'm Michael Moore. Five G, right? We've been inundated with commercials for the last year on five G wireless from Verizon and AT and T. Well. The head of the pilots' union, airline pilots, has said that 5G is going to interfere with a, a particular um, radio device that's in every cockpit that tells the pilot how close to the ground that the plane is. You know, it tell it says, "Okay, we're a thousand feet from the ground. We're a hundred feet. We're fifty feet." They got to know exactly how close this plane is flying to the ground. Obviously, 5G apparently doesn't allow that that piece of radio equipment to work in the cockpit. So, so the Airline Pilots Association and others have been begging for months to slow this 5G thing down or to remove it from anywhere within a couple of miles from an airport. Well, of course, AT&T and Verizon, they don't want you to not have your 5G when you're at the airport. So they're risking, they're risking a pilot not being able to get the information that she or he needs to land the plane safely. This is crazy. I mean, they've already done this in Europe, you know, France and other countries. You know, like you got to be at least a couple of miles away from the airport so it doesn't interfere with the airline communications. Not here, not here. And so just as we were, you know, preparing this while I was waiting for the jackhammering to stop, uh, a thing came across, uh, a bulletin across the, the phone here saying that they're they're going to put a pause at some of the airports on some of these antennas so that the planes don't crash some of the airports some of the planes so, some of what the where are we what is going on i mean seriously i i i you know, it's and and if it's if it's not that, it's something else. I, I mean, they announced you can go to the this website that's connected with the U.S. Postal Service. That's our United States Post Office uh, to order four at-home test kits, which isn't enough, but that's going to be beside the point here. You can order them, and the post office will deliver them to you. Does anybody think? That the post office that Donald Trump created and where we still have Trump's postmaster general, this looney tune of a guy who has no postal experience other than he wrote a check to Trump for his campaign. So Trump made him postmaster general. Does anybody think that that 300 million Americans getting a home test kit for COVID is uh, that this is going to happen? I feel so bad for Biden. I don't know why he's even announcing this. He's announcing it depending on Trump's postmaster general getting everybody a home test kit. We all know this isn't going to happen. I mean, you can, you know, write me in a couple days when you have your test kits and, and I'll apologize for suggesting that this isn't going to happen. But if we can't even get it together to put the 5G antennas in the right place so that a plane doesn't crash. I mean, what has happened to us? What has happened to us? It's it um it's just one thing after another, isn't it? And what a week or two weeks this has been. I mean, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, as we all know, is planning to issue their decree, probably in June, maybe before then, that uh, women will no longer have a uh, universal federal right uh, to end a pregnancy that they don't want, to remove uh, a fertilized egg from themselves. Not a human being, a fertilized egg. And, um, and they're going to do that and a lot of women are going to die as a result of that. We're going to go back to the old days. Some of you are too young to remember the old days. 
Back in the old days, if you got pregnant when abortion was illegal, you either tried to self-abort, i.e. mutilate yourself, and many women were permanently harmed, couldn't have babies after that, and died. Or they went to what was called a back alley abortion. In other words, somebody who's not a doctor, but who is willing to perform an abortion on you, uh, you know, in their home, in their apartment, on the kitchen table, whatever. That's the way it used to be. And women died. So they're getting ready to issue this decision in a few months uh, to kill off a bunch of, of these women who would dare to have an abortion. But this Supreme Court thought, you know what, why do we have to wait till June to start killing people? Why don't we start now? And so last week, they blocked President Biden's order that corporations with more than 100 employees have to require that those employees, if they're coming to work, have to be vaccinated or they have to test on a weekly basis or whatever, which, by the way, isn't, isn't enough. So um, so that means once that, that mandate was removed, a mandate, by the way, that is supported by the majority of corporations in this country. They, some corporations have already started to order the, the employees to be vaccinated because not being vaccinated is bad for business. Because when they have let the unvaccinated show up to work and infect other people or get infected themselves, uh, productivity goes down. Corporate America isn't able to make the things they like to make, which primarily is money, because they've got all these sick people now because of the unvaccinated coming to work. So they've just gone ahead. All kinds of corporations, big corporations, have gone ahead and said, no, if you're going to work here, you have to be vaccinated or you have to quit. That has, in some ways, helped in these companies helped prevent uh, the deadly virus from taking hold. But the Supreme Court said that Biden can't do what the majority of corporations would already wish he would do, which is issue the mandate that you can't work here around other people if you're not going to get vaccinated. Um, And, you know, for the people who I know, you know, I know you like me, I know you like my movies, and you're very upset at hearing me say this about about the virus and about the vaccines. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that I just don't think you're right. And I think you're causing harm to other people. I watched this great basketball player, Kyrie Irving, at a press conference after the Brooklyn Nets basketball game. And he said, look, I, I, you know, they let, they're letting him play in places other than Brooklyn. New York City will not allow players to play if they're not vaccinated. But you can you can you can play the game in Phoenix and you can play the game in Chicago and Detroit and elsewhere. So so they let Kyrie Irving play when they're at away games, the Brooklyn Nets do. And he said last night he made quite an impassioned case as to why he's not vaccinated and why he won't get vaccinated. And you know I I I I I heard him and, and I know that he's trying to do what he thinks is best. He has a right to do what he thinks is best until he doesn't. And you don't get to decide whether or not you're going to be vaccinated because we're, we're, we're getting close to a million dead Americans and millions and millions more around this world. You don't get to say, oh, I have a right to go and infect other people. And if you've bought all the baloney that's on the internet about this, about the vaccine. This is the safest vaccine we've ever had. Uh, I can understand like the old vaccines like polio or whatever, they, they, in order for those vaccines to work, they, in order to trick your body into creating an immunity to polio or smallpox or whatever, they give you a little bit of the polio in the vaccine. Not enough so that you'll get polio. You imagine how hard that was to convince our parents that they all take us in to get polio shots when in the shot was going to be a little bit of polio. In the COVID shot, there's no COVID. 
It's a whole new, and they started working on this. Not when Trump said, let's work on this. They started back in 2003, probably before then, but when SARS be, was a, a real epidemic in certain countries, they started working on, we've got to create a, a vaccine for the coronavirus. We're going to get more of these. And so they've been working on this for 17, 18 years. It's mRNA, and there's no COVID in the shot. They invented a way to, again, trick the body into creating an immunity to COVID without putting COVID in our bodies. There's never been a safer vaccine. And now hundreds of millions have gotten the vaccine around the world. And you don't see people dropping like flies. And they're still having babies. And they're all, this is everything you've been reading about this. You have been lied to by crazy people. Anyways, I, can't, I, know, I wasn't going to spend any time on this today. I really just wanted to say kudos to the Supreme Court for getting rid of Biden's vaccine mandate, which will result in the deaths of God knows how many hundreds of thousands of other Americans. The killer Supreme Court, the Trump court, one third appointed by Trump, and they're going to kill women starting in June, but they're trying to kill us now, stopping this this vaccine mandate that even corporate America says that we need. I like this, uh, just doing a, a solo podcast. I haven't done one of these in a while here on Rumble. And um, I, I like, I, I like, I'm, I'm imagining I'm really just right there with you in the car, in your living room, uh, just talking to you. It, it, uh, the, the intimacy of it, uh, I appreciate. Maybe we all appreciate that a little more during these two years where we've had to spend a lot of time alone and uh, not seeing family and friends and whatever. So uh, in the sense that there are, geez, I don't know, what do we have close to 600, 700,000 on this list. Um, and at any given time, there's 150,000 listening to this podcast. Uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate you letting me into uh, your earbuds, so we can have this little chat. Of course, I guess it's a one-way chat because I don't get to hear what you're saying, but you know, you're always welcome to leave me a voicemail. It's right here on the page where you are listening to me. Uh, there is a, a phone number. It's my voicemail, and it, it allows for one-minute voicemail. I love to hear from you. I love getting these voicemails. Um, and, uh, and in another week or two, those of you who are, are uh, paid members of my of my Substack here, uh, we will do another one of our Q&A sessions together. But I just, I like, I like being able to talk to you about a few things going on. And the main thing I wanted to talk about today is what's going on in the, in the Senate right now uh, over these next couple, three days, uh, which is the voting rights bills that we're trying to get passed. And I want to get into that uh, with you here uh, uh, right now, except I, I need to give a, a shout out uh, to a couple of our underwriters uh, who are helping to sponsor uh, this podcast, help us pay the bills and and um, and get the word out to you. And and I, of course, I deeply appreciate the fact that they um, are wanting to support having my voice out there in this form uh, to the general public. Uh, so let me just, let me give a thank you and, and tell you about a couple of them right now. And we'll come right back here on the other side of that to talk about where we stand right now uh, with the voting rights uh, bills. So I first want to thank our underwriters this week from National Geographic who have an enthralling new documentary out right now on Disney Plus, and it's called The Rescue. The Rescue chronicles an against all odds story that transfixed the world in 2018. I'm sure you remember this. The daring rescue of 12 boys and their coach from deep inside a flooded cave in northern Thailand. This film is a breathtaking effort from the Academy Award-winning directors and producers behind Free Solo, E. Chai Vassarelli, and Jimmy Chin. This is a thrilling on the edge of your seat uh, documentary to watch. And it's just, you don't want to miss this. It's so um, amazing. And it's a movie that not only gives you hope, but it shows that sometimes 
when conditions exist, those conditions bring out the best in people. So watch National Geographic's The Rescue. It's up for consideration for Best Documentary Feature in this year's Oscars, and it's now streaming on Disney+. Plus. And the next underwriter that I want to give a shout-out to is the one that I personally love uh, because I use them. It's called Public Goods, and it's the one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality, everyday essentials that are made from clean ingredients at an affordable price. I'm talking about everything from coffee to toilet paper to shampoo to pet food. Public Goods is thoughtfully designed for the conscious consumer. And their affordable membership model makes it easy for you to get what you need. Rather than buying from a bunch of single product brands, Public Goods members can buy all of their premium essentials in one place with one beautiful streamlined aesthetic. And I've worked out a good deal with Public Goods just for you, uh, the listeners of this podcast, you'll receive $15 off your first public goods order with, and you don't have to have any minimum purchase, whatever it is, it's $15 off. They're so confident that you will absolutely love their products and come back again and again, that they're giving you this $15 to spend on your very first purchase. So just go to publicgoods.com slash rumble or use the code rumble at checkout. That's Public Goods, P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S, all one word, publicgoods.com slash rumble to receive $15 off your first order. Thank you, Public Goods, for supporting this podcast and supporting my voice here on Rumble. Much appreciated. So back to the issue of the day here, and that is our voting rights in the United States of America. Um, They started yesterday uh, debating this on the floor of the United States Senate. And it continues today as I'm uh, recording this. Um, There probably will be some procedural votes uh, today and tomorrow. Senator Chuck Schumer, the majority leader in in the Senate, is trying a number of workarounds so that the filibuster uh, can be removed for this one vote uh, or other ways in uh, to get around this anti-democratic, anti-democracy thing we call the filibuster, where um, a minority of votes in the Senate get to kill an entire bill. Uh, so that's, that's what's going on. It's what's been going on right now and um, not with much success. And of course, all the pundits are, you know, pretty much, uh, they've pronounced this uh, bill or bills dead for many weeks. But uh, Schumer and the Democrats seem to have not given up on it. But when I say that, I really want to be completely honest with what I've been witnessing. Yes, the Democrats, with the exception of Mansion and Cinema, Mansion of West Virginia and Cinema of Arizona, who are who say they support voting rights, uh, but don't want to do anything to help this bill get passed. But it, it makes it seem like the other forty-eight Democrats or the independents who caucus with the Democrats, um. Like this is a this is an important bill to them that they want to get passed, and I've watched some of their floor speeches, and, and you know they've been sending out their literature to us uh, via email. Uh, you're on sadly one of those lists where everybody sends you everything about how you know much they support voting rights and stopping the racist policies that have been enacted by the new policies by at least 19 states that are going to make it more difficult for poor people, old people, and people of color uh, to vote in this year's election and in elections after this. But here's the thing. If, if, and, and if you think I'm being too harsh, uh, I mean, just say so. But I just, I, yes, of course, all of these Democrats support voting rights. But where, where's the real sense of urgency where is the clamor 
Where is the demonstration? Where are the marches? Where is the call for the public to take to the frozen streets of America right now and all of us get out there and do something about this? There's none of that going on. You take a a Democratic senator like Dianne Feinstein from California. I haven't seen her do anything to rally the millions of Americans who, in every poll, say that they support these voting rights bills. I don't mean to pick on her. I'm just saying, pick anybody. Pick Gary Peters from my state in, in Michigan. Pick any of a number of Democrats in the Senate. And where have they been? Where are they today? Where is the call for action? Where is, is the, the spark for people to rise up nonviolently so that our voices are heard on this issue of voting rights? I don't see it. Do you see it? I see speeches. I see pundits. I see them going on cable news, all good, but something like this is never going to pass unless, unless we have the fever, the desire, and that that is heard all around the country. That's not happening. Why isn't it happening? Are Democrats just sort of taking the position they're supposed to take? You know, and they, of course, I know they believe it and all that, but they don't, nobody seems to really want to risk anything to get this passed. Well, when I say nobody, I'm talking mostly about white people, I guess. I've seen a lot of people of color, especially black Americans, over this last week or two out in the streets, in front of the Capitol, in front of federal buildings, demanding that the Voting Rights Act be reinstated. This all began in 1965 when Congress, that's the House and the Senate, both voted to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the first time that it was ever legislated and made into law the fact that everybody, everybody had a right to vote and nobody was supposed to come up with any rules or methods or shenanigans to keep them from voting. 1965. And I wrote in my Substack letter um, this week the story of how I was present as a little 11-year-old kid My mom had taken my sisters and I down to Washington, D.C. because she wanted to show us our government and how it worked. And so, yes, that was summer vacation for us. I know. know. But but how cool, though, that a a, a mother in 1965 would load her 11-year-old, 10-year-old, and 8-year-old children into the car. Our dad had had to work, couldn't get off. Uh, from the factory. So she took us down there and didn't really know what was going to be happening. But, you know, back then, just as you can now, you can go to your, your member of Congress's office or your Senator's office and, um, and get these free passes where you can get seats in the gallery, the little balcony that looks down over the house and the Senate and watch what's going on. And she did that, and and she took us in there. And in in one of the uh, galleries, um, I believe it was the Senate, uh, in this particular week in um, July, I believe it was July of 1965, the Senate was debating a new bill, an idea uh, that people had come up with called Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid, where the federal government would, would make sure that the elderly and the poor would not go bankrupt, would not lose their home. From now on, their medical bills would be paid, most of them, by the federal government. It was an amazing idea. 
And there were many people that didn't like it, called it socialism, communism, whatever. But here we were in the summer of 1965, and us kids were, were there in the, the Senate watching this debate and this bill being passed that gave us Medicare and Medicaid. It was, it was, really, um, it was really something. And, and in that same week or so, a week or two we were there, there was also a debate and votes being taken on whether or not to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we watched that. I mean, I'm an 11-year-old kid up there leaning over the, the, the balcony railing watching these Congress people debate whether or not everybody had a right to vote <laughs> and asking my mom a lot of questions like, why, why are we even talking about this? Well, she explained this, this is a lot, lot, a lot of bad treatment for a lot of people when they try to vote. And so my sisters and I were witnesses to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 being passed. And um, you can read all about I wrote I wrote a, a letter about this, a, a column. And uh, just go to michaelmoore.com. And uh, the, the piece is, is called, I Was There and I Am Here. And you can read uh, the story of our trip uh, to Washington, D.C. So every 10 years or so after 1965, uh, Congress had to renew the Voting Rights Act. And they did. They did. They renewed it four or five times. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about Republicans renewing it. Some of these votes were near unanimous over the years. In fact, the, the actual Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, I think the, the first vote on it in the Senate, uh, there were uh, 77 votes in favor of it, ultimately 79. Only two Republicans voted against the Voting Rights Act, the original one, 1965, in the, in the United States Senate. That is how far we've come and how far we've sunk. So when Barack Obama was elected president, uh, the Republicans decided on day one that they would support nothing of what he wanted to do. Um, and uh, it was very difficult for Obama to get anything through the Senate or the House. And in 2013, the United States Supreme Court essentially threw out uh, uh, much of the Voting Rights Act uh, that had been in place since 1965 and said it's up to Congress uh, to pass this again or, or to fix it or whatever. And so since then, we, we really haven't had a Voting Rights Act and all attempts to pass one have failed because the Republicans have come together here over these last uh, eight or nine years to stop any kind of voting rights bill from being passed and they are doing it right up until this moment that I'm recording this right now they're there in the United States Senate and all of them all 50 Republican US senators have decided to stop this to block this bill every single one of them it, it's stunning isn't it you'd think at least one you know, people like to hang on to this belief that there are some good Republicans. Certainly, you know, Mitt Romney will stand up for black people and people of color and poor people. Certainly, Susan Collins will. Cer certainly, the senator from Alaska will. And then they don't. And they are all planning to vote against this bill. And even though we have 51 votes, if you believe Cinema and Mansion are for the Voting Rights Act. So we have 50 and we have the one we need because the, when it's a tie vote, the vice president of the United States, is, she's also the, considered the president of the Senate, so she gets the vote, and it would be a 51-50 vote. 
But that's not going to happen because Manchin and Cinema aren't going to support majority rule. 51 to 50 is called, that's a majority. 51 is a majority. And they're not going to support that. Um, they're going to back the Republican position on the filibuster. And so here we are, 50 Republicans and these two Democrats call themselves Democrats. And it's so infuriating. I'm, I can't believe I've gone in my lifetime as an 11-year-old seeing this incredible bill pass, only two Republicans against voting rights some 57 years ago. And then this. I've lived to see this. Where not only the, the act is gone, any attempt to create a new act, and calling it the John Lewis uh, uh, Voting Rights Act and the other, I mean, and oh man, if you've read the, this bill, they've combined them now as one bill. So many great things in terms of, um, well, we did this in Michigan in 2018. We passed a constitutional amendment that allowed for same-day voter registration. You could show up to vote on election day. And if you weren't registered, you could register right then. Um, that allows for, you know, a few weeks of early voting because we've, we've doubled the number of people in this country since 1965. So the lines are long and they're longer in places that have black Americans there to vote. Uh, the, this one think tank did a, a survey and found that that in black precincts, the wait in line is 10 times as long as the wait in line in white precincts. 10 times. This is crazy. That means if you're, if you're a white person, let's say you do have to stand in line for an hour. It's a long line to vote on voting day. Black Americans have to stand in line for 10 hours. That's not unusual that if you're African-American, that you will stand for five, six, seven, eight, nine hours. And just to, just to punish these communities of color, um, they've, they've, they've insisted that not only the number of days you get to vote be shortened, the early voting gets shortened in, in these new laws in these states, that nobody can bring you water or food while you're in line. You can't leave the line to go get water or food or pick up the kids from school and get them home. Then just somebody saved your place in line. You come back to it. No, it's illegal now in these states. Wow. It's, it's, it's just, and it goes on and on like this. Um, and it's all intended, of course, for the Republicans to hold on to what little power they have left because more and more Americans have decided they don't want Republicans uh, running the country. As I've pointed out before, uh, there have been eight elections since the election of George Bush the first in 1988. Eight elections since then. That's 34 years ago. Presidential elections, eight of them. In seven of them, the majority of the American people have voted for the Democrat. Even though two times, because of our racist electoral college setup, two of those times with uh, Bush and Gore, uh, the Republican who lost the election got to be seated in the White House as president. And then again in 2016 when Hillary won uh, the popular vote and Trump, though, wins the Electoral College, and he gets to be president. So take those two popular votes where the Democrat didn't get to uh, become president and then add f five more of these elections since Bush the first. You've got seven elections where the Democrat has won the presidency of the United States according to the American people voting. And the Republicans won at once. 2004, and they won it just by one state, Ohio, and only by 100,000 votes or so. That's it. Clearly, the American people have spoken. When you look at the, the population of the states that Democratic senators represent, 
millions and millions more people in the United States have voted for a Democratic senator than a Republican one. Same thing for the House of Representatives. I think it's about a 7 million vote difference between those who who voted in Democratic districts versus those who voted in Republican districts. And yet, here we are. Democrats can't get things passed in Congress. Biden is stymied every step of the way. And we have an outrageous Supreme Court that's Republican-dominated, a third of the court appointed by Donald Trump. It is disgusting. It is embarrassing. What does the rest of the world think of us? We call ourselves a democracy, but those who have the majority of the votes don't get to have a say. We have a majority in the, in the U.S. Senate that say they're for the voting rights bill, and yet there won't be one this week. The Democrats look defeated. I mean, I don't know. By the time you're listening to this, you may or may not be able to turn on C-SPAN and watch some of this, but it's... And our poor president, Joe Biden, is, has already admitted defeat, and he's more hunched over He's, he's more dejected. His tone is not one of rallying the troops, but rather acknowledging the place of defeat that he's in. And, um, and the Republicans are talking like they're going to win the midterm elections this coming November. And they may. I don't think they will. If, if we, the people, all show up, And if we, the people, um, are willing to tolerate the roadblocks that are going to be in front of us in order to vote right up into an including election day, if we're willing to do that, we'll pull this off in November. But that's only going to happen if we run the right candidates, if we get out there and get our neighbors and friends and family and co-workers and co-students to to get out there and vote. And as I've suggested, the states that will put a ballot measure or two on the ballot that will help bring out the base of the Democratic Party. If you have a ballot measure this November, sign the petitions, get on the ballot. There's still time for to legalize marijuana, to outlaw gerrymandering, to raise the minimum wage, uh, to uh, pass, again, the Equal Rights Amendment, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that we will win if that ballot measure is on the ballot. And then once in there, uh, people more than likely will vote for the Democrat, for Senate, for Congress, for local offices. And it's, it's in our hands. I mean, if, if, we wait, if we wait for the official Democratic Party, if we wait for Biden... Uh, to come out of his funk, uh, this won't happen. We have to do this. We have to do this in our neighborhoods, in our schools, at our workplaces. We have to organize people. We have to make sure they're registered to vote. We have to support and do whatever we can do to make this happen in November. I mean, there's still time if you want to call your senator and, and tell her or him, how you expect them to be voting, or call any senator, let them know. There's a live operator right now on duty. He or she will connect you uh, uh, to your senator. If you don't know the name of your senator, just tell them your state. They'll connect you, and there'll either be a live person in the office, or if there's too many calls coming in, you'll get a a tape recording, uh, and you'll a voicemail, and you'll be able to leave a message. You can call the U.S. Senate right now. Here's the, here's the phone number, 202-225-3121. I'll give it to you again, 202-225-3121. Even if it seems like defeat, it's our voice must always be heard. We must always take a stand. They need to know we're out here. They need to know we're the majority. And they need to know we're going to show up in November. 
Um, let's just take one more second here to thank our last underwriter uh, of the day, and then I'll, I'll have some closing words. And that's Express VPN, our longtime underwriter for Rumble with Michael Moore. Um, Express VPN. Uh, I truly appreciate uh, them supporting this podcast and supporting our privacy online. Going online without ExpressVPN is like using your smartphone without a protective case, right? You don't, you don't do that, do you? No. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network, your online data is not secured. Most of the time you'll be fine, but all it takes, as you know, is just one accidental drop to make you wish you'd protected yourself. My crew and I, we use ExpressVPN when we're making our movies in order to keep our work protected. We use it because ExpressVPN is super easy to use, and no matter what device you're on, phone, laptop, smart TV, all you have to do is tap one button for instant protection. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash rumble. That's express, I'll spell it out for you, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash rumble. And if you put the slash rumble in there, you can get an extra three months for free. Expressvpn.com slash rumble. Thank you for supporting this podcast. These Republicans, wow. This, this is a dead party. This is a party that hates this country, that favors all the wrong things. Republicans weren't always like this. I mean, I didn't agree with them on anything. I don't, I don't agree with the Democrats on a lot of things. But these Republicans, on such a basic issue, in a democracy, the right to vote and to make voting easy and to, and to make sure that every voice is heard. What is more important? I mean, you could say, well, the defense of the country is more important. And yes, of course, we were attacked. You'd want to be defended. But if you're, if while you're defending the country, if you ever have to stop and ask exactly what is it I'm defending, because this is a country that won't even support the right of everyone to vote and to vote without harassment. I mean, really, if that's what we've come to, if that's what we've sunk to, and if it's the Republicans that have brought us down, and I know some of you listening to this, you know, you voted for Republicans, you've thought of yourself as a liberal Republican or whatever that is, those days are gone. This party really has to go. This is the anti-American party. And for those of you who still love this country, and you say disagree with me, you disagree with the positions that I take or that I fight for, great. But, but go and form a new party. Form something that supports your belief system. But this party that is still beholden to the defeated former president, hopefully the defeated, soon-to-be-indicted former president. If, if, if that's all the Republicans have become now, where they just kowtow to him, why are you part of it? And if you are part of it, then that means you believe in the racist things that they now believe in. It means you're a climate denier. It means, now oh, don't say to me, oh, no, 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 Mike, I believe that that the, the environmental issue here, this is real. I believe in it. Yeah. Okay, sure. Well, why are you still voting and supporting these people that are killing the planet? That are making life difficult for people. We can't get through COVID because of all this nonsense that's going on. Did you see that report this week that Oxfam, the charity, they, they put together that... Since the pandemic began in March of 2020, almost two years now, that in these two years, the 10 wealthiest humans on earth, their net worth has gone from a combined 700 billion. It's just 10 
10 guys, mostly 10. I think they're all guys, 10 guys. And at the beginning of the pandemic, they were worth 700 billion together. And now their wealth has gone up to 1.5 trillion. The pandemic has been very, very good to them. It's been very, very good to real estate. And, and, and what has happened to the rest of the people? 99% of the people on the planet, their income, their wealth, their worth, financial worth has gone down. 99% have seen the drop. This is amazing that during a global plague, the wealthy, the rich got richer and everybody else is in a struggle, all kinds of struggle, financial struggle, struggle with her kids, schools, everything. And in the midst of all this, these Republicans, they've done everything to block the other parts of Biden's uh, human infrastructure bill, the things that will help parents, families, kids, old people, poor people, all those things in his, what he calls his Build Back Better bill. They've essentially blocked that. That seems to be gone with the wind at this point. And they're going to try to hold on to the power because they know the American people no longer want them. The majority don't vote for them anymore. So the only way they can hold on to power is to stop as many black people, Hispanic people, other people of color, young people, old people, all of that. <laughs> it's, it's, they know their days are numbered, these Republicans. And they're not gonna, they're not gonna go down without a fight. And the fight is to try to prevent people who usually vote for Democrats to make it harder for them to vote. And that's what we're facing here today and tomorrow. And this is what is so disgusting and appalling that they would debase our democracy like this. My friends, you know, we're just all going to have to be more active, more busy. We're going to have to raise money to help people in these poor communities to be able to vote. Come November, we're going to have to get out the vote. I know a lot of you are sick and tired of all this. The fight has gone on too long. Now we're just trying to stay alive so we don't get this virus. Trying to raise kids in this era. It's, it's all, I know, I know, I know. But, but what's the choice? I can't tell you how many people have said to me they've turned off the news, and I don't blame them. They're just trying to get a little bit of peace and sanity. But while we're looking for peace and sanity and a break, the enemy, the people who are who hate this Constitution, who hate people that are not white, the old way, the old guard, they are very active and they're very busy and they're spending a lot of money. And they're going to try to do everything they can. It's the only way they can win is to cheat. You, you just, every time they talk about the, this last election being rigged or cheating or whatever, when it was the, it's so many different groups and judges and everything have determined it's the, it's, it was the most honest election where all the votes were counted correctly. And when they've done a recount, all they have found really are more votes for Biden. It's, it, they know their time is up. People who do demographics and studies and all this are predicting now around 2042, the majority of this country will no longer be white. The majority will be people of color. We're just 20 years away from that, from the year that we're in right now. And, and the people who are frightened by that, they are working overtime to hold on to as much power and as much money as they can. And the only way to stop them is for us to stop them. Get involved. Get involved. Form your own neighborhood group. Do whatever it is you can do starting this week, this month. Get those ballot proposals on that will bring out 
voters who will vote for the Democrats. Send Biden a note to cheer him up. Come on, dude. Don't give up now. The majority of Americans are with you on every single one of these issues. Look at any poll. The majority support paid family leave. They support a raise in the minimum wage. They support an equal rights amendment for women. Go down the list. The majority of Americans support the positions that Joe Biden and the Democrats have taken. And it's not just Joe Biden. It's from from way on the left to the middle of the Democrats, and even some Republicans support these things, an end to mass incarceration, uh, legalizing marijuana, things like this. Uh, You know, we can build the movement and the movements that are necessary for this to happen. We've done it before. We can do it again. And... There is no time to waste, my friends. The Republican Party, enjoy your final days. This can't hold. This can't last. I know that in my heart of hearts, as hard as this may be right now, I know that we will rise above this and take control of the country that the majority of the people the kind of country they want it to be. That's the way it's going to be. And you can get on board with that or not. I invite you to get on board. Well, that's about it uh, for today. I've really enjoyed doing one of these solo uh, podcasts with you and talking to you uh, directly. Um, There's a lot going on. I know uh, there's, uh, there are many fights that we're in and many fights ahead of us. Uh, I don't want you to give up. I don't want you to fall into despair here. Our history is full of taking two steps forward and one step back, sometimes three steps back. Um, But in the end, uh, we've come out in better shape. That has to continue. Uh, We're lucky that we have um, a younger generation that is active, that is educated, that is concerned, And they will not tolerate this kind of behavior anymore. So to the younger people who are listening, teenagers and young adults, thank you for everything that you have been doing in these recent years. It's your voice that must be heard. It's your voice that we must all support. And I'm, I, I have, uh, I have a belief that we will beat back this bigotry, uh, we'll beat back ignorance when it comes to our environment, we'll beat back a lot of these things, and we'll make it better for all of us and for the generations to come. It will not happen on its own. Everybody has to play a part, even a small part. Uh, I will continue to do that. Um, I thank all of you who listen to this podcast I now send it to you. It's in your email box. uh, And uh, uh, you can sign up for my Substack there if you want. Uh, That's free too. You can be a paid member uh, to support our work. That's great. Um, But uh, in whatever shape this takes, uh, I will be there uh, both in my writings uh, and in this podcast, in the next film uh, that I'll be making this year. And the other things uh, that I've got planned uh, in front of me. Um, I thank you for your support uh, for all of that. Um, um, Sign up at michaelmoore.com. And please share this podcast with others. I'd really appreciate it. All right, we're we're out of time. My thanks to our executive producer, Basil Hamden. um, Our editor and sound engineer, Nick Quaz. Uh, who had to deal with all the uh, jackhammering at the beginning of this. Uh, Thank you uh, for that, Nick. And thank you to Donald Bornstein uh, for uh, everything helping out, especially these during the holidays here in these last couple of weeks. uh, Enormous uh, help to us here with the podcast and with the Substack. So thanks for all of that. Thanks to all of you for listening and for doing what you're doing 
uh, to get us on the right path. So much appreciated by me. Uh, don't give up. There's no reason to give up. It seems like there is, but that's what they want us to think. Let's get over that and let's get busy. Thanks, everybody. You've been listening to Rumble with Michael Moore. I'm Michael Moore. We'll talk soon. Thank you.